So, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody to the Researchers Excellence Network event, which is focused on the very hot issue, the future of the European Union. What's next? What is awaiting for us? Sholei Academy of Vilnius University is coordinating this international network and uh, is always open for scientific discussions on um, very important issues which are important not only for scientists, researchers, but for the society as well. And today we have this uh, public lecture discussion with two key uh, main, uh, keynote presenters. We have Professor Adam Yarosh from CGA, SGH Warsaw School of Economics, Poland. And we have Professor Uros Pinterich from Alexander Dubček University in Trenčín from Slovakia. So thank you very much both professors for accepting to be keynote speakers for today. And uh, I would like to remind for all participants of this international event that you always are able to give some questions for our key speakers. You may give questions in the chat line or just to raise your hand and me as a moderator will give you the floor to speak. Uh, please turn off your microphones when our key speakers are speaking and try to be muted uh, till the word will be given to you just to avoid any sound loops or uh, noises. And uh, when your presentations or speeches will be over, we will ask you as participants, as attendees, to give some questions for our key speakers. So first of all, I would like to thank to our professors for being here, for accepting for this public event. And I see a lot of different uh, participants in this event from different countries, from different universities. I'm quite sure we have a very wide uh, audience, very different audience in the room. So um, I'm hoping very exciting and interesting scientific discussion. First of all, I would like to ask Professor Uros Pinteric, who is uh, uh, coming from originally from Slovenia, as we know, but uh, represents the Slovakian University, to give uh, the first speech about the future of the European Union. As we know, Professor has the long term experience on public policy making uh, on the EU aspects as a Jean Monnet uh, chair holder. So, Professor, uh, the floor is yours. We hope uh, that you will give some very hot uh, topics to discuss for, for our researchers. So, Professor Urosh, the floor is yours. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, that I can be uh, again with you. At the same time, uh, there is a uh, apology because of voice disruptions that might come from my side uh, for a very simple reason. I am going through something which uh, pop pop popularly today would be called probably COVID, but more likely it's just a, a bad case of cold. Yeah. Um, so once again, thank you for the invitation. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak on uh, some ca some something which is between the science and astrology because um, what what's next it's fr fr from the scientific perspective it's very hard to say what's next uh, especially in social sciences we, we have the tendency uh, to be smart backwards yeah so um, prediction is not really uh, part of the reality that we, we would be dealing with. But based on the previous trends, uh, we can obviously talk about certain topics. Future of the European Union is obviously hot topic, not only last few years, even less, uh, even, uh, less so in last few weeks. Uh, future of the European Union is something which is happening on daily basis. Yeah. Um, it started to happen actually 
with the first ideas of uh, European countries joining together, which is much older than we are usually aware. Yeah? So first ideas about joint Europe is based on the American uh, experience of late late uh, 18th century and early uh, 19th century uh, started started actually um, with Polish author as far as I understand in uh, 1830s approximately there was the first ideas about uh, United States of Europe, as far as I was able to fi find the information. And since that time, we, we are actually uh, reheating the idea of one of the civilizational um, cradles of the modern world, how to live peacefully together. Because obviously, Europe as a continent has a common history of, uh, let's say, different elements of greatness from, you know, Greek scientific discoveries to Roman legal system, Roman system of governance, if you want, and so on and so on. Obviously, with later disruptions in the, in, in the Dark Ages and so on. But uh, what, what we have in common in all these uh, few thousand years of, uh, how to say, Europe as conscious continent, yeah, um, is that we were constantly in war. And one of the rare things that happened occasionally were possibilities of maybe centuries of relative peace, like Pax Romana, like a concert of great powers after defeat of Napoleon. And at the end of the day, obviously also after the Second World War, um, this European Union project, which probably helped uh, countries in the Europe to live relatively peacefully for a um, foreseeable period of time. Now, when we talk about peace in Europe, we obviously need to be uh, somehow careful. It is relative peace. It's not absolute peace. We know the situation in Northern Ireland, yeah, which was going on. Uh, we obviously know that um, Balkan territory was stirred into the 10 years war after disintegration of Yugoslavia. Um, and the conflict is rising again. And obviously we cannot, we cannot completely ignore the events uh, which are right now happening um, in Eastern Europe, so in Ukraine concretely. But what is the future of Europe in this perspective is probably more, uh, sorry, European Union is probably more related to how European institutions see themselves and at the same time, uh, same time, how European member countries and their populations sees themselves in the relation to the European institutions. This is the question of future of the European Union. Yeah? Uh, it's not the question of what is happening around us in many cases. These questions are uh, taking place just within the system of uh, global system of international relations. Uh, this, uh, what is happening around us, has probably much more to do with the human rights and development of human rights um, in, in the individual countries. But it has very little to do with the question of future of the European Union. Question of Europe, uh, question of the future of European Union, for me, is much more uh, connected with how we relate ourselves to question of Brexit, for instance. We already all forgot about the Brexit, but actually Brexit is providing more important information for European Union member countries, as well as for European Union itself, what happens with the European Union, than what was going on with, for instance, uh, management of uh, coronavirus, which is forgotten uh, miraculously within a few weeks. Yeah? Um, what, is, what, what all this 
daily event, which obviously take much longer, uh, what they really do, they just show the problems that European Union has to solve one way or another, or European member countries have to solve one way or another. They are not, uh, how to say, things that change European Union. They are just showing what European Union has to deal with. Yeah? Um, if, if I need to be uh, somehow on the astrological side, so trying to tell the future of European Union, uh, I can still return back to the political science. Because one constant is the change. Yeah? Regardless if you are talking natural sciences or social sciences, change always happens. And second thing that Europe should learn from the, from the history is actually that nothing is eternal. Question is what it takes to change its form. Is European Union still existing when uh, Great Britain is out? Maybe. It's a different one. It's European Union still existing uh, when we try to get new countries. Um, it was in 1990s when, when the, there was talks about attempt, um, when the, there were talks about attempts to uh, get into the European Union even the countries which are uh, on the Caucasus side of the Black Sea. Yeah? So even those countries were considered to be potential European countries. Uh, Turkey was trying for a few decades until Erdogan, after 2015 migration crisis, had enough uh, and pulled the Turkey out of the attempts to join the European Union. Even the Turkey had the ideas to join the European Union. Uh, but what uh, we, we can see is that even within f three to four basic uh, linguistic groups which define, you know, uh, populations bigger than nation, uh, we have problem to understand each other within the context of European Union. And that when it comes to the bad situations, the countries which have power will still first take care of themselves. Uh, maybe we already forgot because, you know, corona, uh, coronavirus is in our mind already previous century. Um, but when it started, Germany seized all the medical transports which were traveling through its territory to another countries. And from this perspective, what I can learn about the European solidarity and union when the problem starts, countries which have power, they will take care of themselves first. And from this perspective, uh, I can obviously start to question the strategy of uh, 2017 until uh, 2025, which was uh, addressing what should happen with the near future of European Union. And obviously there were some implemented old, old ideas, and those ideas were from, from um, 1980s, 1990s, uh, trying to uh, answer the question if we want European Union a la carte, and this was before big enlargement in uh, 2004. Uh, so if we want European Union a la carte, we want some kind of differentiation between the core countries and periphery, so center and periphery, uh, we want to have European Union of some kind of tires, or um, obviously the, the next idea was uh, trying to answer the question if we want wider European Union or we want deeper European Union. And strategy for um, European Union in the near future, uh, I think that it was actually named uh, Future of the Europe. Uh, it was published in 2017, March 2017. Uh, was actually bringing up the same things. And based how it was written, was shown that either we stay as it is, and that's kind of not really favorable scenario, or we go towards a greater federalization of the Europe. So having big federation, 
Uh, sure, sounds nice. Um, sounds fair, sounds European. But I have not only theoretical, but also personal experience with a bit smaller federation of only six nations, or better, six republics, uh, because nations would be something else, um, which were trying to manage themselves. And immediately, when you removed strong leader, some of the some people or most of people would still call him dictator, but from second perspective, it was just a strong leader. And when you remove him from the equation, the whole system starts to fall apart. When you have the democratic rotation of the government, which was the case obviously in Yugoslavia, I'm talking about this situation, um, nobody, especially under the economic pressure, under the nationalistic pressure, nobody is able to survive obviously more than 10 years. Slovenia didn't want to leave Yugoslavia initially. Slovenia just wanted bigger economic autonomy. And we were the first one to leave at the end of the day. So from, from this perspective, from this experience, uh, we can say that sooner or later, European Union with all the cultural differences will, be ha will become so hard to manage that it will start slowly to crumble apart. In the times of Brexit, we were already talking a bit about different other exits. Some of them, they were a bit more realistic based on high level of Euroscepticism in those countries. Some of them were just like, oh, what if we do so? Yeah. But um, obviously, there were ideas that European Union starts back to shrink. And obviously, there is lots of situations when we can ask ourselves what exactly we are doing here. Um, just one of the cases, because obviously, as I, it was mentioned, I'm traveling between Slovenia and Slovakia um, on rather regular basis. Uh, Austria is the country that I need to pass, or it's the country of choice that I'm passing. Since migration crisis, 2015, there is no Schengen anymore. It's always the exception which allows Austrian authorities to control the borders. But from the perspective of, you know, all the countries around being Schengen member countries, this means that Austria doesn't trust somebody in open borders. Migration crisis, uh, crisis of 2015 is long gone in the extent that it was, uh, was at that time. Not to mention some other elements of uh, hypocrisy which we can see today in 2022 in relation to migration crisis of 2015. Yeah? And a few other things that we should mention, but I believe that I'm sh uh, shortly running out of time. So uh, at the end, what, what I would expose in this um, brief, actually more rant that then analyzes because it's uh, too much of everything, is that European Union will have to be internally coherent first before it has some kind of potential chance on, on long-term modification into the stable political subject. As long as we have all the, all the different differences, especially the cultural ones, and we cannot just throw them through, through the window, European Union remains in permanent danger of disintegration in one way or another. Because it will be always somebody who will want exception. It will be always somebody who will want different treatment. It will be always some question which will remain unanswered or it will be resolved in the in the day-to-day -day situation, but not in the systemic manner. So uh, European Union um, remains, um, how to say, relevant in, in institution, which is able to survive only as long as we have certain level or rather high level of flexibility on one hand of European Union itself, 
in adjusting to different uh, demands from member countries. And as long as we have enough flexibility from member countries that they are able to compromise among themselves. Major question, what is the future of European Union comes from within European Union. Yeah? Um, and to, to answer this one, uh, I believe that is just um, the, the only possible way on very, very quick uh, note is to be open for cultural differences and being able to accept different different approaches. Uh, but what, what will actually happen, yeah, that, that's something that uh, we all hope never to know in our lifetimes how it can end. So we hope that uh, the whole thing will continue to, to remain flexible and uh, live for another few decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Urosh, uh, for your interesting insights. Uh, we see that James is raising his hand too. James, would you uh, mind to open your microphone and try to give a question? I have done that. Good morning, Pro. Good morning from here. Uh, good morning, James. You are online and you can ask a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, uh, how has the EU encouraged member countries economically, you know, maybe by uh, having a uniform uh, uh, pass, uh, as in, uh, maybe removing an uh, embargo on uh, member states going to the other countries and all that. How, how, how are they encouraged member states economically or member countries economically? Uh, Professor Urosh, did you hear a question? No, unfortunately, I didn't hear the question in full. So I, I understood something about European member countries and economic situation, but I didn't hear the details. All right, bro. What I what I said, I said, how has EU encouraged their member countries economically? If I understood correctly, how uh, EU empowered or um, yeah empowered the uh, member countries economically yeah uh, i understood the same so professor can you try to answer um sure i mean uh economically uh european union uh, obviously performs uh the fiscal function of money redistribution from richer countries to to uh, poorer ones, yeah. So the countries which are not achieving certain level of um, certain level of uh, European G GDP average, they, they they are filled in, or they have the possibility to be systematically filled in with the uh, um, money which is coming predominantly from the countries which are way, way richer in this perspective. Uh, so uh, European Union is, uh, or European budget, it, it's somehow, how to say, um, mixing mechanism which transfers the money which comes, for instance, from Germany, and uh, one of the most famous cases of big success was when the money was going from uh, richer European countries to the poorer, at that time, to the poorer uh, case of new coming Ireland. I think it was in 1970s, if I'm not mistaken. And Ireland, since that time, uh, was using European funding for its own development uh, that it put uh, its economy to the level that now Ireland is able to finance the development, the development of economies in other countries, like for instance uh, Poland, Slovenia, Romania, Slovakia, and so on, and so on. Yeah, and obviously when we will reach, Slovenia is uh, quite close uh, to, to the situation that we will actually become net payers, as it said, net payers into the European budget. Uh, we will be contributing, on one hand, more that we will be allowed to get out of European budget, and we will, uh, through, through this, uh, help the countries we are, we, which are doing wars. Yeah? And this is, this is how European Union uh, economically empowers 
the countries in one way. The second thing is obviously through the very basic uh, through very basic principle of um, uh, this uh, economic agreement, economic free, uh, agreement uh, about free movement, uh, so, so even basic principles of European Union, free movement of people, uh, free movement of capital, free movement uh, of goods through the European countries, which enables that whatever is needed is sooner or later, because countries can uh, ban this free movement, especially with the new coming countries for a certain period of time. Uh, we were facing this uh, in case of enlargement of uh, 2004 in, uh, for, for our countries like Lithuania and Slovenia and so on. Uh, UK at that time said, sorry, free movement to the UK will wait for a bit for you. Yeah? But sooner or later, it opens. And we are able to get for better jobs. We are able to get different services at uh, without the um, you know being twice taxed. We we are able to move the uh, capital freely. What it means? It means that we can invest in Germany just as equally as we were Germans. Yeah? We are able to invest in, in, in any other country. So when the money is able to move without any kind of restrictions, obviously. Obviously, it helps a lot. So this, again, empowers the member countries of the European Union. Um, I would say that European Union, in this sense, is empowering itself at the end of the day through empowerment of economic empowerment of the countries. But obviously, especially after the 2008 uh, economic crisis, then 2015, um, uh, migration crisis, we see that we have certain elements where we are still acting as national uh, protective economies. Yeah, we are still following also our national economic interests. And in this way, sometimes, especially uh, bigger countries would harm the smaller ones in this perspective, or we would ha uh, harm ourselves by imposing imposing certain restrictions by the European Union. For instance, uh, lots of countries tried to so, uh, save their economies in 2008 and a few years later by subsidies, state subsidies to the companies. And European Union said, nope, sorry, it doesn't go this way. You cannot subsidize your business. Business needs to work on its own or it needs to die off. That was the problem of automotive industry, um, especially in France, as far as I remember, for instance. So on one hand, yes, there is a elements of empowerment, which are functional, like uh, budget transfers. Uh, on the other hand, there is a free movement of goods, capital, people. And at the same time, yes, there are restrictions, which also uh, sometimes harm our economies because of the EU. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I can see a lot of uh, raised uh, uh, hands with a lot of uh, questions, but we still have the second speaker who will continue with uh, some economic uh, issues as well of you. So, dear participants, I would like to ask you to keep your questions, to remember your questions, to write down them, <laughs> and we will open the discussion part after the second presentation. And after this, we will come back to the discussion. Just uh, we would like to hear the second presenter, Professor Adam Yarosh. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Uros, for your uh, presentation. It was uh, very interesting with a lot of uh, with a lot of well uh, interesting um, uh, thoughts and uh, and analysis. What I will do is uh, kind of well supplement because i have some other thoughts to add to be to, to, to actually to be precise with some opinions i do agree with some of them i have a different view uh, but of course we can also discuss this uh, after after uh, what i have to say after my presentation so i what i would like to uh, how was i thinking about this question future of the eu what's next uh, 
Uh, well, generally speaking, how, what Uros said, uh, not only the economics, but as well political science begins to be an, a science where we can comment what has already happened, yes? Because we can see that even politics is more and more unpredictable, yes? Because even even uh, the situation that we face now of, of this brutal war in Ukraine, there were a lot of experts and political scientists who said that no, Putin is bluffing and he won't attack Ukraine. All he wants to make is to make pressure, but at at the end we have what we have. Yes. So, uh, but uh, trying to maybe not uh, trying to maybe not to predict what will happen because well, it is it is hard to say what can what what will happen because well, we have to remember that. In, Today, when we speak, the still situation is very well unstable. We have no, we still don't know how the war will, will end in Ukraine. Ukrainian army has a lot of a lot of successes in the battlefield. We see also we saw in in, in last days, and we see all the time this uh, well uh, total well moving and and start uh, and well shocking uh, recordings from Bucha and other towns around Kiev with war crimes and even genocide, as some people call it. Uh, so we will see how it ends, because also this will determine the future events and future actions of the European Union. Yes, we have to, we have to be, be conscious of that and we have to consider it very strongly. And this is what I would like to, actually what I would like to start with, because what we face in last years, uh, especially last three years, is uh, well integration through crisis. We have all the time crisis situation actually, yes, uh, because uh, firstly we had uh, we have this uh, COVID pandemic, yes, totally unexpected. I remember uh, well in February 2020, I was in Brussels doing. Uh, a trainership in European Parliament, and I really came back only a few days before the whole pandemic started. Yes, and who could who could expect that the universities will close, that we will have online classes with our students, and that the, the streets suddenly will become empty? Yes. Uh, so this was a very severe crisis, and now, as some in Poland joke, uh, Vladimir Putin, through his decision on war, uh, cancelled the pandemic somehow. How, yes, because nobody speaks about pandemics anymore. Everybody is now focused on the war, yes. But but still, well, on the slide you can see, uh, as of the end of March, uh, this uh, the results of pandemics. Uh, uh, it is in the scale of the European Union because this is our topic for today. So we had well, one one hundred twenty six million cases of COVID. Yes, from experts and uh, doctors. Uh, say that well, this this number, the real number, can be much higher, and we have reported over one million uh, deaths, yes, because of this disease. So we can see the scale of the crisis, which which is like well huge, yes. As well in Poland, for example, the number of of, of uh, deaths was over one one hundred thousand people, yes, as if one big city disappeared. So we can see how the crisis, uh, how big was this crisis in terms of public health. The other perspective was the economic uh, crisis. Yes, loss of GDP, uh, high inflation rate. Now the war is pumping the inflation. Uh, Poland again has big problem with that. So as far as I've seen the statistics, even Lithuania has has big problems, even though you are in the eurozone. So it, it shows that not even euro uh, currency can protect the country from that. Uh, so, <clears throat> and well, the EU had had to react to the pandemic, yes. And of course, there were some cases that state egoisms and so on, like Germany not letting the other countries to uh, uh, not letting to export the medical. Uh, materials, or for example, there was also some some scandals commented uh, in Polish media at the time that Germans contracted for themselves the vaccines, whereas countries agreed that they will buy them uh, within the European Union, so together. Uh, but this will, these are the issues that I would like to actually address at the end of my of my speech. Uh, now, rather to show 
few elements what the EU actually succeeded in while managing this crisis. Yes, well, the problem of the EU is that, well, to make any decision, yes, we have partially, we have those European institutions and so on, but in fact their decision, uh, well, field is quite limited because at the end there are sovereign states of the European Union, well, unfortunately having different interests and usually they are the first to react to different crises, yes, and we can see it on the example of COVID and on the example of uh, war nowadays. Uh, but still, the, the EU had some had some uh, success in managing COVID uh, pandemics because you know the health systems, like managing hospitals and and uh, health staff and all the things, they are uh, the state competences. But still, the EU institutions managed to facilitate to buy the equipment, for example, yes, like masks, like gloves, like respirators, and things like this. Uh, they coordinated the activities of the state to some extent, uh, put a lot of money to finance the research. Uh, also, there was this mentioned common vaccine purchase that at the end we had the situation that, well, the purchase maybe in the first moment it was, well, distributed in, in slower pace, but after one or two months it, it turned out that every country has become enough uh, vaccines even more than people willing to be vaccinated, as in Polish case again. Uh, but at the end, we, we managed to prevent the situation that uh, indeed Germany would buy only for themselves, or France would buy only for themselves, and Poland or Lithuania will wait for the vaccines until today, probably, yes? Yeah? Or maybe I'm exaggerating, but way longer, yes? Yeah? So this common vaccine purchase well prevented the such situation, and maybe slower, but everybody got their their part. Uh, also, the EU COVID certificate. Yeah, maybe something not that important, but uh, as well automatically recognized by the countries, which makes the traveling way easier around Europe. Yes, remember, we have the common market, so there is a big uh, personal flow. Big, uh, there are, for example, people who live in Poland and work in Czech, in Czech Republic or in Germany, so they have to move every day through the border, yes? And also this was a big problem during COVID. So such COVID certificates helped a lot, yes? Uh, or there were some, some also smaller scaled actions like helping EU citizens to come back to their country and so on. But more important, I would say that in COVID, uh, in COVID uh, crisis, uh, there was this long-term economic uh, activity, yes? So funding and mechanisms that would help the countries in longer term uh, to recover economically from the pandemic. Yes, there is this mechanism, Next Generation EU, multi-annual financial framework, which is also the highest in the history. And this is a lot of money which, can, which countries will be able to invest, a lot of additional money, also partially like kind of new money because the, the European Union uh, took uh, debt Yes, common debt, not as states, but as the EU as a whole, which is kind of new. Some some people say that, well, this is kind of uh, similarity to the, the, the founding of the United States, when these the colonies also uh, took public debt together, which, well, brought them way, way more together than other things, yes. Some people say that this can be also very strong integrative factor, this pa common debt taken in the name of the European Union. And also in multi-annual financial framework, this is still this mechanism of where the richer countries give money to the, to the, to the poorer countries, in fact, because there are uh, countries that pay less than they get from the EU and countries like Germany that pay more than, than they get back, yes? But this is, this is also some kind of simplification, I would say, because, well, we are kind of used, used to it, especially in the so-called new member state, although we are not, not so new, there will be 20 years in the moment. But, well, on the one hand, EU is giving us this money to invest, to develop, to modernize, and Poland, Lithuania, 
Slovenia as well and Slovakia profited a lot from this. Yes, we had a lot of investment in road infrastructure, in railway, in cities, in local government, all the well different types of investments. Of course, our farmers also profited a lot from agricultural policy. But on the other hand, the old European states, they also profit, yes, because their companies have unlimited access to our market. If you look, for example, at those big investments in Poland, yes, where the, the motorways are built, where the railway lines are built, most of them, most of the, 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 the companies that build them are Italian, German, Austrian, and, and other ones, yes, they, they get huge money in here which they make on, on the public contracts and not only public contracts. Yes? The companies from the old uh, European states uh, also operate on the, Europe, on the Polish market and they have huge profits here because the fact that our society is getting richer and the purchase power of our society grows makes also a lot of profit from the companies and further to those states as well. Yes? So it's kind of both uh, well, win-win situation where both parties get something. Yes, so it's not only that those states from old Europe generously support us, giving us the money from the European in in the form of the European investment fund. Yes, we have to remember this because this is quite important. On the other thing, for example, nowadays I don't know how it is in Lithuanian case, but but in Polish case there are a lot of companies that are gaining strong position in uh, uh, European markets or in the markets of the old European countries like Germany, like France and Spain and, and other countries. Yes? So it's also kind of opportunity for our companies to, to be there. But coming back to the crisis, so this is, well, big, big uh, financial instrument in which, with which the countries will be able to, well, <clears throat> overcome the COVID and so on. Uh, then uh, uh, this this money should also be invested in different areas, which you can see on the slide, which are kind of future, you know, investment in the future, like digitalization, research and innovation, also the climate change, yes, which has kind of new dimension in the perspective of the war and problems or possible problems with deliveries of Russian energy resources, yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, oh. then the second crisis coming further, the second crisis is the, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, which we can also see some, you know, problems, yes, that, for example, there are countries that are not happy with the sanctions. There are countries like Hungary and Orban who openly say that they, they support Putin, yes, or support, maybe not support, but, well, they don't want to engage and so on and so on. Germany is also kind of, you know, saying something, doing something else. Uh, there is big pressure from the Eastern European countries uh, to, to change it, to, to be more, more like more active against uh, Russian aggression in sanctions and other things. But at the end, well, firstly, countries condemned the war activities by Russia, yes. Uh, there were some economic sanctions, new sanctions are upcoming. Also, the European countries accepted 4.2 million war refugees, which is also an unprecedented number. Most of them came to Poland, but also significant numbers went to Hungary, and now other countries also accept them. Uh, there was, for the first time in history, warfare and weapons supply for the Ukrainian army. So this is also kind of a new thing. and. Um, and uh, significant support, or of course humanitarian aid, and the support for the countries that are accepting uh, refugees. Yes, which also is is an important thing because if we now in Poland accepted 1.5 or even maybe now it's even 2 million people, it is kind of challenge. Yes, to to well to have them here, to welcome them, to give them decent uh, living conditions, and so on. Yes, and this. European Union also has, uh, or is still working, or, or have already done it, financial support in this case, yes, which is also uh, important. Um, another problem for the future of Europe, which I would like to, so this is 
integration through crisis, just to sum up this point, which on one hand shows some differences, but also shows that this cooperation and coordination of activities uh, and dialogue, which also happens in the European uh, institutions, for example, in European councils, you have regu regular meeting of country leaders, yes, which is the value by itself. Uh, but it shows that this integration crisis, uh, well, that this, uh, the different crises somehow enforce closer cooperation and enforce closer uh, or, or another steps uh, in, in uh, being closer in cooperation and doing things together. Yes. Uh, EU enlargement is also kind of uh, issue that, that somehow more or less has come, come on the agenda again. Because now we have formal candidate states, which are five, yes, Albania, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Turkey, which was already mentioned. Uh, in, uh, also, there are potential candidate states like Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo, so Balkan states mostly, yes, which is one issue. And another issue is are the post-Soviet countries that applied for membership within last days after the, the 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 beginning of the war in Ukraine, yes, and now there is you know this is also a problem that has to be addressed in some way because if you remember the 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 Ukrainian crisis started 2014 and why what was the reason? The reason was that Ukrainian people wanted to integrate with European Union, yes, and through war Putin blocked it, yes, firstly overtaking Crimea and some territories in Donbass and Lugansk regions, and now they, they, they started because of its full invasion, yes. And at that time, because the Ukraine, Ukraine wanted to be associated country with the European Union, yes, so that was the real reason of the war. So we can say that Ukrainians are fighting for being in Europe, yes. And I, I don't think we, we can just, you know, say, yeah, hey, all right, it doesn't matter, yes. We cannot be indifferent to this, yes? So this problem has to be addressed in, in, in a way. Why am I mentioning also Balkan states in this context, yes? Because on what Uros already mentioned, there was uh, the problem of Yugoslavia. And, well, there are countries that are already in the European Union, like Slovenia and Croatia, but also the other countries cannot be left to themselves, yes? Because if they are left to themselves, what happens, yes? What happens with Bosnia, for example, and Herzegovina? The tensions are still there, yes? They are maybe not that brutal as they used to be during the war, fortunately, but they are still there. The economic situation is difficult there. And the EU has to address it in a way, yes? Because if we don't do anything, in 10 years, maybe Putin will have new allies there, yes? Serbia is anyway some how in between, yes, because they are traditionally close to Russia, also culturally, because of orthodox culture and, and so on, yes. And uh, again, this, this here, also the, 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 the application of states like Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, uh, well, we cannot ignore their, their willingness uh, to be part of the European Union, I think, yes, and they have to be addressed in a way which can lead also to rivalry with Russia, of course, yes. Uh, here I put some slides to show that, you know, also this, this joining European Union is, of course, not automatic, yes. There are the whole catalog of criteria which has to be negotiated. The countries have to do a lot of work themselves. We, we now, the war somehow overshadowed it, but Ukraine before the war had a lot of problems with oligarchs, with corruption, and, and things like this, well, this is also something that Ukraine has to, for example, Ukraine has to work by itself. Yes, of course, now everybody is, is focused on the war, but, but this will be kind of a challenge in the, for the future Ukrainian integration. EU, this is the question, how the EU can help here, giving the roadmap, giving some, some perspective, institutional assistance, I think there is a potential, yes? And this should be done. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, and yeah, and this is something what I would like to address as well, that this Russian aggression of Ukraine, on, on Ukraine, is kind of geopolitical window of opportunity, yes? Because Russia, on, on one hand, well, showed its weakness 
because well the army that everybody thought that will overtake Kiev in few days is stuck there for longer than a month and with no perspective of, of simply winning this war. So this is kind of first element. The second element is that well now everybody sees the real face of Russia, yes. What country is that? What regime is that, yes? And <clears throat> and this has to be also kind of, you know, addressed and and uh, and responded to. And the first third thing is that well one of even in, in this in this uh, perspective that Russia says well, we want neutralization or demilitarization of Ukraine. But also the European integration of Ukraine could be an answer here, because, for example, Finland is a neutral, neutral country, but still, so it, it doesn't violate in any way the security of Russia as they perceive it, yes, because there are not, no military installments and things like this, but still, economically, Finland is perfectly integrated with European Union. Why cannot we implement such model in Ukraine or in Moldova? Yes. This would be also an opportunity for Europe, of course, because the, the, there is, it's a big market with a lot of valuable people, resources, and so on. And last, last uh, element, last few minutes, if I may. Uh, well, there are some upcoming and un unsolved problems that Europe will have to face in, in, in the next time. Yes? So first is definitely the new economic crisis that we can expect, yes? related to inflation, related to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, violation of supply chains. Now, for example, we've, we experience that Ukraine and Russia are big exporters of, of uh, well, food or, or grain and wheat and, and, and uh, agricultural products to you, which can also have, have influence on our market. There will be definitely post-war issue of post-war recovery of Ukraine. Of course, in the first situ first moment, the humanitarian aid is key thing and military support, but this is done also a little bit outside of the EU because here the NATO is the main main force. But still, after after that, when the war comes to an end, uh, there will be it will be a big issue, yes, to support Ukraine and to help to rebuild it. On one hand, problem challenge. But on the other hand, opportunity for both both part, parties. Yes. So one hand, Ukrainian will have chance will have chance to modernize. On the other hand, European countries, companies, and businesses will have big chance to go there, to anchor there, and to bring this way also Ukraine to the West, closer to the West, to, to the European Union. Yes. Maybe this will be kind of first step in their uh, future membership. Uh, another thing is the status of Ukrainian people, because the state Ukraine is still outside European Union, but few million Ukrainians are, are already almost Ukrainian citizens. Yes, for example, the war, I don't know how the policy is in Lithuania or Slova Slovenia, but in Poland, they got almost automatically a status that they have almost the same rights as, as Polish people. They can live, they can work, they can go to uh, medical aid. Uh, hospitals and uh, healthcare system, yes. Uh, their children are in the schools, they are in pension schemes, so they only cannot vote for the parties in the elections, but all the other things they have automatically become in in last few weeks, yes. So these people are already part of the European Union, we can say, yes, and, and th this is this is also something that the EU will, will not be able to ignore uh, when the war ends, yes. And uh, last, last slide, uh, more general things uh, that, that uh, will, be have, will have to be faced. So first is the uh, unsolved dispute over the rule of law. We have this topic which is coming back all the time, uh, especially with Hungary and Poland in, in the main role, yes, because of different reforms. In Poland, the judiciary reform is the problem. In Hungary, uh, different activities of uh, Viktor Orban and his government. But we can see uh, today it's Tuesday, so on Sunday there were elections in Hungary and with overwhelming victory of Viktor Orban, yes? So this is the, at the end, the will of the Hungarian people. 50, over 50% of Hungarians supported Orban, yes? So, which means we have to also find 
some uh, well ways of discussing or, or of discussion dialogue with with such regimes or maybe reflect of such with such countries and also make some more general uh, more general um, uh, no reflection on how this mechanism should work because well we don't want another brexit yes another exit and uh, here is also the last point on my slide but uh, good to comment in this moment definition of the union and state competences also what uros said we i think we came to the point where it should be clearly defined and also divided what is european competence where the european union and its institutions should act and should make policies and what should be left to the state i think this way we will really be able to well not there will be way less conflict because now also the brexit was about it actually yes because david cameron he made a lot of effort before the referendum to negotiate to renegotiate different things but this was one of the main topics that eu is interfering too much into the british competence yes and for example this disputes over the rule of law we also have such points such you know voices of politicians in the debate and so on saying that well okay judiciary judiciary is is the competence of of the of the of the member states and not of the eu yes and of course the the polish judiciary reform is is really totally wrongly done and so on this is a, another topic but here this is an issue, yes, because now it's Poland and Hungary, but what happens if it is France, for example, in May when Marine Le Pen wins the elections, yes? We have to also ask such questions, yes? Um, okay, just to finish, uh, uh, there will be a few other problems to face, like energy crisis due to sanctions over Russia, looking for new energy supplies, but here also this uh, green energy uh, issue, the, 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 this, this energy change can help, and in here the eu has a really big field to to uh, to work on um uh, migration pressure if there is a crisis uh, economic crisis we will have again waves of migration from the middle east from africa which also somehow has, has to be faced yes in my opinion the best way would be to develop the way of supporting the, the states around uh, europe yes so that people can live there on a good uh, on a good economic level and don't are not motivated to migrate to Europe. Yes, this would be in my case, in in my opinion, the best solution. Also, the U Europe has to find its role in the U.S.-Chinese ri rivalry, which is more and more visible. Yes, but this is also a, another big topic which I will, which I, I don't want to open, just to just to you know signalize the issue. Yes. So uh, well, there are a lot of coming up in one sentence there are a lot of different issues which which are uh, coming and uh, well but but we also have to see have to have to uh, notice that you know during this different crisis europe is getting closer in different things yes and this is positive and it shows that when the even if there are problems that this frame that we managed to achieve until nowadays helps in many cases yes because in many issues it was easier to manage different crises being together and not acting on our own thank you very much thank you so much professor adam uh, thank you for your presentation uh, i would like to ask professor uros i uh, uh, noticed that you knocked uh, according to some Adam's insights, that you truly agree with them. And um, maybe you can reflect to what Professor Adam mentioned as upcoming problems. Do you have the same vision or you have additional insights on this? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you also to Professor Jarosz for uh, his presentation. As he mentioned on a brief reflection at his uh, beginning of his presentation about uh, my speech, the, 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 there is obviously points on which we agree and there are the points on which we will probably disagree because of, if nothing else, because of geographical space that we occupy. Yeah? Because... Um, Obviously, 
uh, Ukrainian situation is affecting Poland way differently than it's affecting Slovenia. Yeah, so so uh, th- this is already one part of the story. Uh, second part of the story is obviously the, the question of um, personal preferences, we, which things uh, we prefer to deal with, which things we try to uh, talk about. Uh, so as you uh, noticed, I, I was maybe a bit more on, um, how to say, general side, why he was much more dealing actually with the concrete policies, concrete problems, uh, and actually exposing much more the uh, solutions uh, compared to to me, who was uh, maybe a bit more critical towards different problems that we are facing. So, obviously, it's not... Sure, there are points on which we both agree. That that's absolutely true, and th- there is the system of differences because uh, also I didn't address before um, the question of rising extremism through European countries. Yeah, so we know that uh, Slovak Parliament is occupied by neo-Nazi um, party, which is inside. Uh, in uh, German parliament, you have significant portion of new far-right uh, party, which was uh, which emerged as a response to the 2015 migration crisis. Yeah? And obviously, when we are talking about um, integration of different people, uh, we, we can talk about it from the perspective of measures, policy measures, uh, as he was mentioning them, or uh, sure, on the other hand, we need to ask ourselves on the European level, from the perspective of general European values, what is the difference between people who were fleeing, for instance, from Syria from war, compared to the people which are fleeing from Ukraine in in, in the uh, presence of war as well. So. Um, Obviously, our behavior in both cases, uh, as European behavior, our behavior is different, how we were treating the situation, and also uh, which countries were supporting which uh, migration much better. If right now Germany is rather standing on site and being kind of silenced and just responding to whatever is necessary, um, in the case of 2015, uh, Germany was rather welcoming to the migrants or refugees which were coming uh, from uh, from war zone of Syria and obviously economic migrants from other, uh, let's say, what Arabic countries to, to call them this way or um, other crisis uh, crisis territories. And obviously we can see uh, r- right now, j- just a few months before Ukraine happened, yeah, uh, after 20 years of American engagement in Afghanistan, the rule was of Taliban's was re-established, again endangering uh, one of the uh, more sensitive parts of population, so uh, women in their uh, role into the society. So with, with all these things, yes, um, I appreciate his insight. Uh, and as, as I said, we share, we share obviously uh, common points, but uh, also we, we maybe... Uh, supplement, as he said, each other from exposing different elements that at the end of the day, Europe needs to deal with all this. Yeah. So on one hand, with everything that he said, yes, Europe needs to deal with. But Europe cannot ignore also the other part because it's also part of uh, the, the whole living situation. And we cannot say that um, the problem that we, we have, I would say, is that we cannot, and from perspective of cultural cohabitation, we should not prioritize which things are more important. It's just the question what appears on the list because of some urgency, and we are solving it. But we should not say that because it's urgency, it has the priority over the things that we can always, you know, debate, uh, let's say, in academic circles, or we can debate uh, with a bit more uh, time available to this. Yeah, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the comment. 
Thank you so much. Uh, one provocating question for both of you, maybe first of all for Professor Adam. Uh, you mentioned about EU enlargement. Yeah, and we know that uh, President of Ukraine asked to let Ukraine to the EU uh, under different rules as, um, as other countries came. And uh, do you think it is possible or not? We know that we have some rules, procedures, criteria, like you mentioned, but we know that this situation is absolutely different from the previous uh, 20, 30 years. So maybe we can change the rules according to the situation. What is your opinion? Just provocating. Is it possible to do in a quick way? Well, so I would say that it is not possible because of the rules and procedures that you say, uh, that you mentioned. But, uh, well, it, of course, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, Ukraine should be left on its own and, well, you can join when you fulfill all the criteria and procedures. Uh, no, contrary. I think that first what you, European Union should do, and as far as I read, more or less, it has been already done. Uh, even the Lithuanian president uh, um, um, talked about it a few days or, or two weeks ago. President Nauseda, after the summit in Versailles, he announced that uh, well, there is a general agreement on the on the fact that Ukraine can will have a green light. Yes. So, firstly, of course, this is. For now, for the situation when it's so tense, when the war is still on, and and where the fight, uh, the combat is is ongoing, of course, this is the most important thing. Yes, telling Ukraine and Ukrainian people, yes, we want you in the EU. And afterwards, of course, when when uh, hopefully soon the, the peace will come, uh, then of course the the whole the procedure would, will have to start. Yes. Because, you know, the problem is that why all these things which are in the European Union, yes, all these, all these institutions, also why these institutions, we have to ask ourselves this way, why are, were these institutions created? Because it's a common market. So everybody has equal access, so every, every state has an equal access, but also every state has to adjust to different norms, different, well, solutions, legal solutions, and so on. So that we cannot create kind of a hole in this in this uh, common market. Yes, that for example, a country which has totally different norms on something, uh, like on the quality of products, joins the European Union, and then what? All the companies will go there, produce much way way cheaper. Yes, and in five years, or, or they, the whole industries in other country will be bankrupt because of the cheaper flow from the other country, yes? Of course, this is very much simplified example, but uh, definitely Ukraine, what, what, what I would imagine myself, yes? We will see how it develops because now it, it's too early to say. Now the political consent is important, yes? And clearly stating, yes, Ukraine has green light and open path to join, yes? This is the most, the crucial thing now. But as I say, in European Parliament, there was, yes, uh, I, as far as I remember, over 600 MEPs were, uh, were in favor for, this, uh, for, the jo for joining. Also, the European leaders agreed on it, and this is for now an important thing. And then when the war finishes, when there is peace, we will see what will be the conditions of the peace. We still, it's hard to say for now. But then Ukrainian, Ukraine will have to come on the path of getting to membership in maybe a five years perspective. They have to accept a key communitaire, so the legal, uh, legal system of the European Union. Uh, they have to, <clears throat> they will have to accept many other things, yes, because also we cannot allow that, that well, Ukrainian, Ukraine joins the European Union and then the oligarchs take the European funds, yes. Of course, this would be wouldn't be acceptable. Yes, so this Ukraine will also need a lot of institutional work. But on the other hand, also for for, for such cases, EU has instruments because when Poland joined, I think Lithuania and Slovenia the same. When our countries joined European Union, there was a lot of work done also in this and with assistance 
even there were pre-accession funds, as maybe you remember, yes? Maybe not that big money to make investments as we have now, but still that this money was significant for that time, yes? And all these things had to be, well, uh, also prepared for Ukraine to show them clear paths and clear levels and, and uh, stages of negotiations and of, of of uh, of joining yes and i think well if if it was in five years perspective this would be a quite a fast track i would say but still if ukraine is on this fast track they will be also in a different position as as before yes coming on that track thank you so much adam urosh is it possible to to do it in a fast track or is it uh, more about uh, preparing uh, more favorable conditions for accepting this country um you know question of possibility is different th than question of uh of of appropriateness so um i see that ukraine is fighting multiple wars at the moment one is the one that we are paying attention to, but at the same time, Ukraine is fighting with Europe over its own position, uh, trying, to, trying to get some kind of favors. Because European attempts to join the European Union are not from last 40 days. Uh, they, they, they have some history already. And in this time, Ukraine on itself did not do any kind of sufficient development in progress in fulfilling what Adam already mentioned as European standards. Not enough that it would be appropriate for any kind of serious consideration to join within short period of time. So answer is obviously fast track is possible based on the political pressure, but it would be highly unappropriate and probably damaging for the whole European Union. And I believe that European Union as an institutional system as, a, as well as a you know, consortium of member states have still, has still enough common sense that it will not succumb to these pressures. Uh, so um, in reality, no. Ukraine needs first to resolve its relation with, with Russia one way or another. Because this is not just the relation of last, uh, how to say, 40 days or 41 days. This is not just relation since 2014. This is the thing which has historical, uh, historical issues. And if European Union was keeping, for instance, um, now called Northern Macedonia over the name for, uh, I think, about a decade, from even starting the negotiations to join European Union, we need to uh, we need to have enough, let's say, face that we will apply the same standards regarding the uh, what is expected from the applicant country, what is expecting from country which wants to join the European Union. And no, uh, I don't believe that we would get any kind of fast track. Thank you so much, Professor. We had some questions online uh, with raised hands before, after the first presentation. I'm quite sure that Adam has answered some questions maybe with his presentation, but if there are some questions, you are welcome to give. I saw that uh, Daniel gave, uh, wanted to give some questions and uh, unfortunately we were not able to hear you. Uh, we see that attendee Pick Vasi 79, uh, interesting nickname, uh, is raising his hand so I'm not sure who is under the nickname but maybe you can unmute yourself and try to give the question to our oh, presenters. All right, Prof. Uh, uh, Prof. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> This is Osman. Hello, Osman. Nice, to, yeah. nice to hear you. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, this question goes to uh, Professor uh, Urish. Um, Prof, I would like to find out uh, with regards to the future of uh, the European Union. Um, what do you think might have been the main reasons for uh, the United Kingdom leaving the EU and 
to what extent has the departure of uh, Britain affected uh, the, the Union? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the question, Osman. Um, it's, how to say, relevant question, especially since we kind of do not ask it enough. Uh, so you have two parts of it. So um, what are the main reasons of the UK uh, leaving the EU? Yeah. So th that is the first part. Uh, well, I would say that about the institutional reasons we, which we were able to follow, I would say that main reason behind is the difference between the culture of UK in relation to what is what was the pr uh, predominant stream of management of the EU. So if you remember, uh, UK was already before the Brexit, before exiting the European Union, not just a few years before, but systematically, always asking for some exceptions, always asking uh, for, for some different treatment. Uh, UK is colonial superpower, and it has big problem to be told by some other countries the, how to manage itself, because UK was actually uh, running in two very similar systems. One is obviously EU, which was much more strict, and the other thing which UK was running by itself is the British Commonwealth. Yeah, and sometimes certain things were obviously not working uh, just because of those differences, and sometimes were obviously not working from the perspective of um, mental grandiosity of British Empire, which still exists in the heads, yeah? um, and obviously on more concrete level, the fact was that um, in, in some other way, um, be, before Professor Yarosh mentioned that uh, what will happen if, if uh, Ukraine will be providing, you know, cheap labor force uh, if it joins b b b b before uh, adjustments uh, uh, in the economic sense, also Great Britain was by and large flooded uh, with cheap workforce after 2004 enlargement. Obviously, the, then was transitional period, and people felt endangered. People or British industry felt endangered in the field of um, fishing policy because one of the uh, important industry of the United Kingdom was uh, fishery and uh, because European Union had its own fishing policy in many cases it squeezed the rights of UK how to fish uh, at the same time gave the rights to fish also to um, in, in the British uh, waters to um, fishermen from other countries and so on and so on so there, there was a whole complex and when you put one thing to another all those things together uh, obviously obviously, obviously resulted in this minimal, minimal win of referenda for Brexit, because it was pretty much 50-50. And if it would be taken, I don't know, 14 days earlier, 14 days later, result would be uh, potentially just the opposite. So it was, it, it was not, uh, we, we need to be aware that it was not, you know, clear no to the EU. It was just the lottery which the British politics had to follow afterwards. Yeah, so it's not it's not that much. Let's go out and we have enough of everything. No, there were good things and there were bad things, and just uh, result pushed the country uh, into certain path. Uh, what were the effects on the EU by um, Brexit? Uh, well, for sure there was uh, economic effects. There were uh, effects which. Um, um, how to say, change the forms of cooperation, uh, but from from the whole perspective, uh, I would say that so far European Union survived the Brexit rather well. 
British companies were the first who had to adjust themselves, uh, usually by opening the uh, sister companies in Belgium or something like this in order to still being able to enjoy at least partially the benefits of uh, European free market. Yeah, But in general, I would say that uh, European uh, Union was shocked in 2016 afterwards they had obviously the negotiation process and at the end of the negotiation process the whole thing kind of watered out because they had about three years time that european union as well as uh, united kingdom managed to get at least partially prepared how to mitigate how to reduce the um effects on the economy the thing that happens just a year later was actually much more um problematic so in 2020 uh corona crisis started so i i would say that if there would be no corona crisis uh it would be a bit easier for both sides but this way i think that they were um even forgetting what they were doing before and they somehow survived uh without uh without uh, as much damage as everybody was predicting before yeah so there was damage but uh, predictions were much worse than the results thank you so much professor uh daniel can you unmute your microphone we hope that we can hear you now in, in summary in summary what i want to ask is um why is the union treating Turkey the way it's been treated? And what is the hope of Ukraine after the invasion or within the invasion process? That's my question. Uh, I guess Daniel is asking about enlargement processes, integration, why EU treats like like this, like 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 uh, taking all those okay. uh, procedures. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Adam, maybe you can try to answer, please. Well, uh, a lot of a lot of have been have been already answered, uh, and uh, I will, what I could add to it is uh, actually agree with Uros uh, on what he said that well, to be become a member of of the European Union also is it's not only that the European Union says yes we want the state to be with us and so on, but it also needs quite hard and longer term effort of a country that wants to join yeah because <clears throat> uh, because uh, well being in the european union means joining this big organism which is the european common market yes and well this means that a lot of mo uh, well a, a lot of uh, most of all economic solutions legal institutions legal solutions legal regulations and so on has to be similarized which means or at least put to a certain standard equally e more or less equal to everyone yes which means usually in the candidate state that this standard has to be higher and this this uh, well these countries have ha have to adjust to the standard so going up yes and developing in such cases yes because as well we have countries for example like iceland yes or like i don't know san marino that could be tomorrow the member of european union without maybe any negotiations because or, or switzerland yes because they they have already this standard in terms of well economy in terms of economic development in terms of democratic institutions and how they work and how they operate, low level of corruption and things like this. But usually the states that are, well, kind of, well, uh, well the, the states that, that are candidates and that want to join usually are not at this level and which means that they have to make a lot of work, a lot of effort to, well, get these standards yes for example we had also such enlargement like for example 1995 yes where austria finland and sweden joined the european union and it was like a quite simple thing yes because these three countries they were neutral and not eu members for political reasons yes because of cold war 
and, and Russia and, and Austria because of post-war neutral status, status. And in this case, it was quite simple to, to, for them and for the EU, for the EU to accept them and for them to join. Yes. But in cases like, for example, of Poland, a lot of different, for, for example, institutional solutions, yes, Re, uh, um, uh, legal regulations, they had to be adjusted to the European standards. For example, I am, you know, the expert in local government, yes, and even Poland had to uh, implement the uh, territorial reform because one of the most important uh, policies in the EU is the regional development policy. And to prepare for that, Poland had to reform very deeply its territorial divisions and create voivodeships, which are 16 big regions in Poland. And now these big regions accept the European uh, Structural and Investment Fund in, well, part of it, but significant part of it, and then further redistribute it to municipalities, to cities, to companies, to, to other, to other beneficiaries, beneficiaries, yes? So this is also part of the integration, the, the effort of the state to, to adjust, to, to, you know, to meet the standards and the expectations. Uh, for example, the same is when you want to join the, Europe, uh, the euro currency, eurozone, yes? Also, this, the criteria are quite strict. Why? Because if if a, a country joins that doesn't meet the criteria, it can be firstly problems. It can cause problems firstly for the country, but also for the for the others. Yes, that's why it's it, it is so complicated and sometimes lasting so long. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Adam. And uh, as we can see, the time for our discussion uh, came to the end because our plan was for one hour and a half. I know that there are some uh, additional questions, but we agreed to, to stay with the regional development um, students and Professor Uros, maybe Professor Adam can stay as well for a longer little bit for our um, personal discussion, uh, like after party, uh, but the scientific discussion uh, for this moment must be ended. I would like to uh, summarize this just in one sentence, that the future of European Union will stay an important issue despite of the period, despite of the uh, decade, as we discussed this issue with Professor Urosh, I guess, 10 or even more years in Cholet Academy. Uh, we meet with him uh, and Professor Adam in various different um, events, and we have more something to discuss because some additional crises, some problems are coming new, un unexpected, and unrevealed how to deal with them. So I wish to all of our participants to keep um, an eye on EU policy, uh, to follow what is happening, and maybe we will have another nice scientific discussion very soon, just because of the need. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank to our key speakers, keynote speakers, Professor Adam Jarosz from Poland and Professor Uroš Pinterich from Slovenia, Slovakia. And uh, we hope that this scientific discussion gave you some insights for, the, uh, for your future research and for your future understanding how the European Union is dealing with some crisis and how it, uh, it is going to uh, meet other unexpected uh, challenges. So thank you to all uh, participants. So we are announcing a short break, maybe five minutes, just for our key speakers to relax a little bit. And uh, uh, I will ask if you have the possibility just to stay for longer for a nice discussion, internal uh, discussion with our students. So thank you to all participants who were joining us and especially for our key speakers. And we hope to meet you in another events of Researchers Excellence Network. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.